that's where Jesus seems to show up. That uh, it's when things get a little crazy that uh, we find that he delivers us. And um, there's a natural tendency for people to find problems. If everything in your life is good, you'll find something to complain about. It's just our natural inclination. So uh, I, I encourage people, I tell them, you want to you know, you be more at peace with your life? Get around some people with real problems. <laughs> and, uh, you know, to give you a little perspective, go out and pray for people that, uh, whose lives... Actually, I encourage people, get around people who have problems so big you can't fix it. Because then you can let care of the false guilt that i got to fix their problems. Well, you are not Jesus. Yeah, if they're 20 bucks away from getting their electricity turned back on, you can help them. If uh, they're $2,000, well, maybe not. But you can introduce them to the one who can help them. And then instead of them saying, wow, what a nice person, they say, wow, isn't God good? These storms come in life. They just happen. There's been a verse reverberating in my, uh, in my mind out of Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah 31. I forget where exactly it is. Where God tells Jeremiah, if you've run with men and are all worn out, how are you going to run with horses? You notice on the internet, nobody is posting 2023 is going to be my year. All right? Everybody's looking at like, uh... I'm worn out. I'm exhausted. Well, thank God the Lord is our strength, and during our time of weakness, that's when He comes through strongest. And so I just want to encourage you, we are always looking for ways to connect people to Jesus. Because we've got a whole bunch of people here today, and, uh, who, and uh, others who usually come here and couldn't make it here today, because... At some point in their life, they were so broken, they said, this is it, my life is over, I'll never recover. And yet, here they are today, singing the praises of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He continues to take our brokenness and make something beautiful out of it. Many of you, during your times of prayer this week, some of you sent feedback, but you would think after a while you'd quit being surprised when the Lord shows up. Some of you are like, yeah, it's my time for prayer, and you make a list, and you pray, and you're like, there you go, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Right? And then there are other days where you start, and all of a sudden, boom, you are overwhelmed like a wave crashed over you. Maybe your heart broke for a certain group of people that you were praying for, or you just felt the presence of God in an amazing way or felt His love. And... Um, and sometimes you feel the Lord calling you to do something. Now, it's important to separate the Lord calling you to do something and Facebook calling you to do something. And there's all kinds of people, oh, if you were a good Christian, you'd be doing this. Well, they got a million different good things you could be doing. You don't have enough time in your life to do all the good things out there. And Jesus didn't look at the disciples and say, come, actually, no, go, do good things. No, he said, come, follow me. And as they followed him, he told them to do certain things, and they did it. That's why another reason it's so important to connect with Jesus rather than just trying to be a good person. Our goal is not to be good people. Our goal is to be God's people mm -hmm. and to do whatever he calls us to do. I, uh, some, especially young, enthusiastic young men, they... Uh, they're like, I just want to do great things for Jesus. It's like, why don't you ask him first? <laughs> Otherwise, you're just a fan. You're not really part of the team. And, you know, if he is calling you to go feed the hungry and you're standing on a soapbox preaching, you're not living in God's will. And if you're out feeding the hungry when he's calling you to preach on a soapbox, you're not moving in his will. It's like, well, how do you know the difference? Well, ask. <laughs> Get connected with Jesus. But you got to do away with the false guilt because some people, they have a great passion for serving um, people with Alzheimer's. And it's just their heart loves them and wants to care for them. There are others who just want to bless toddlers and, and share with them Bible stories and, and help raise them up. So they shouldn't be making each other feel guilty for not getting involved in their passion. 
because each one is God given. So there's false guilt that you ought to be doing this and ought to be doing that. What you ought to be doing is what Jesus calls you to do. And there's two ways to find out what Jesus is calling you to do. One, read the Gospels and see what he literally says. Go do this. And the other is in your times of prayer, sometimes Jesus tells you, he gives you something specific to do. And I want to encourage you, don't do things like I've done where I think it's a good idea that just randomly popped in my head. And I said, oh, I should do that sometimes. Actually, no. It's something God is calling you to do. And usually, unless he says, wait, he's calling you to do it now, not three months from now. Because if he wanted you to do it three months from now, he'd tell you in three months. I'm talking about something that surprised you during your time of prayer. I hope you write it down. I hope you toss it back up to the Lord and say, Okay, Lord, what do we do with this? Because disciples of Jesus follow him and do whatever he says. Heavenly Father, as we look to your word, we are looking in excited anticipation at you speaking to our hearts and our minds. Lord, there's all kinds of things out there, all kinds of good causes we could be a part of. But Lord Jesus, you have invited us to come follow you. And there are lots of commands you've given us on how to treat people along the way. But our main goal, Lord, is to fix our eyes on you and do whatever you call us to do. And so, Lord, open the eyes of our heart that we would see you more clearly today. Open our ears to hear your voice speaking your words of love to us yet again. And Lord, open our hearts that we would hear you, trust you, believe you at your word, and do what you have called us to do. Because Lord, walking with you for one day is better than a thousand days anywhere else. We just want to dwell in your presence all the days of our life. So Lord, speak to us today as we look to your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, we are in Matthew chapter 14 this, uh, this Sunday. I'm just thinking through what Matthew 14 says, and I feel like parental guidance is suggested. <laughs> it's a little gruesome here at the beginning of Matthew 14. You know, Jesus <laughs> talked more about the kingdom of God than anything else. And... If you want to know what the kingdom of God is like, sometimes you look at what the kingdom of men is like and think, yeah, that's not it, <laughs> right? It, it, it's a bad idea following what people think is the best way. Matter of fact, it, a couple of times in Psalms and Proverbs, it says there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. We have a graphic example this morning in Matthew 14. We'll start by looking at verses 1 through 12, and it says this. At that time, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus and said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He's risen from the dead. That's why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. So Jesus was doing miracles. Herod heard about it and thought, Oh no, I killed a holy man. His ghost is back and he's doing amazing powers. 
He's a little freaked out about it. And then it has kind of a, a backflash here on what happened. Herod throws himself a grand birthday party, invites anyone who's anyone in the kingdom, and he's married, or at least living with, his brother's wife. And John kept telling him, that's really not a good idea, especially for God's holy people, the Jews. And then his brother's wife's daughter, who I guess at this point is his niece slash stepdaughter, comes in and dances in a way that pleases him so much, he's ready to do just about anything. I'm thinking more like pole dancing. Yeah. May have got him kind of worked up. He's like, I'll give you anything you want. Some other gospels say, up to half my kingdom. He's trying to sound all big and bad like Xerxes promising to Esther. And she's like, I don't know. <laughs> and she asks her mom, who doesn't like John the Baptist, giving him grief about, you know, them living together away from her husband. Ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so Herod, trying to save face on his oaths, like anybody, now there is a man of integrity. He keeps his promises. <laughs> yeah, not really. So he winds up having a human head served at his birthday party. That's as good as the kingdom gets when it's not the kingdom of God. A couple of things we can learn from Herod. Don't make big, stupid vows. <laughs> Number one, because when you make a big vow in front of everybody, you're really trying to gain glory for something twice. First, when you say you're going to do it, and then second, when you do it. <clears throat> Jesus said, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. So don't make big vows. I am going to do something great. How about doing something great and let your actions speak for themselves? Second, don't hold to stupid vows. Just confess in front of everybody. You know what? That was really a stupid idea. I'm not doing it. I mean, for Pete's sake, because I'm such an ethical person, I will behead the prophet of God and bring it on a platter. Now, if you have to sin to keep your vow, yeah, confess your stupidity, take the embarrassment, and do what is right. Herod thought he might lose people's respect if he didn't behead John the Baptist. Instead, they're like, I'm not coming to his birthday parties anymore. And second, and this, or third, this may be the bigger thing. Don't hold the stupid vows that you made to yourself. Some people do things neglectful or abusive to others. He'd say, why are you doing that? When I was 10 years old, I promised myself I would never. And you're still acting like a 10-year-old. Actually, most 10-year-olds don't do that. You know what? God is not impressed by these stupid vows. Just confess them and let them go. Now, if you promise somebody you're going to do something, yeah, it's much better to do something. I love how... Uh, one time when uh, Abby and Noah were little, they were staying with Grandma Rose, and they went somewhere, and Grandma Rose promised them ice cream when they got home. Well, then they got delayed. They didn't come home till 10 p.m. <laughs> and she's like, if I get my ice cream now, it's just going to be all bad. And with tear-filled eyes, but you promised, Grandma Rose. <laughs> I have zero recollection of this. So she wanted to... <laughs> yeah, it's a sugar coma. <laughs> yeah. She wanted to hold to her vow, but she realized 10 p.m., this is going to be all bad. So she negotiated. She renegotiated the promise. I'll tell you what. If you go to bed now, we will have ice cream for breakfast. I have recollection of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, okay, so there was an agreement renegotiating. The next morning, bowls of ice cream instead of cereal for breakfast. And... It was before church, guys. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I think the only she thing she asked was, please don't tell your mother. <laughs> Understand this, though. God is not impressed by your boldness. And also, your boldness in a vow does not obligate him to act. 
You don't dictate to God what he wants to do. I met people who have great faith in their ability to have great faith. And yet their acts of boldness have nothing to do with obeying the commands of Jesus. They're just trying to impress people by how loud they can be in the name of Jesus. There are a few vows that we are to make, such as Jesus, I give you my life. I will do what you call me to do all the rest of the days of my life. That is a vow that we should hold to. There's another vow we should hold to. When we promise to be faithful to one another in our marriages. But you know, there's only very specific vows that God tells us to do. And really, those are part of our acts of worship. So I hope if, if there's some value, I promised I will always subscribe to this magazine. I promised Grandma before she died 50 years ago. It's like, yeah. Grandma doesn't care at this point. Don't hold the goofy vows. Let's go on. Now that we've heard about what the kingdom of men looks like, let's see what goes on in the kingdom of God. Verses 13 through 21. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. This is his cousin who was just murdered. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it is already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. <coughs> and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, besides women and children. Some quick points about this. Notice it starts out by the disciples telling Jesus what to do. <laughs> That's always a bad idea. Thank God he doesn't, you know, zap them and they go up and smoke and the rest of you are saying yeah he is patient and loving and merciful with us they tell jesus what to do like jesus i think it would be a good idea if you sent everybody away because you know the sun's going down instead jesus takes their instruction says you guys do it i learned from that people come up you know what we should do as a church I think we should buy a bus and pick up children from all over town. I said, great, if the Lord's put it on your heart, he's probably calling you to do it. Oh, no, 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 I'm just an idea person. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. So Jesus tells them to do it, and they tell Jesus they don't have enough. They only have five loaves and two fish, right? And Jesus says, well, give them to me. He doesn't say... Really, you slackers? I know they're hiding stuff in their cloaks. Come on, get out there and find it, you lazy bones. No, he doesn't do that. He takes what little they have, and what does he do? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for providing for us today. He doesn't complain about what little he has. He thanks God for it, because he said in a different, in a, in a different parable, the whiners will always whine, saying they don't have enough. And he says, what little they have will be taken away, and they'll be given to somebody who will actually do something with it. So Jesus takes the five loaves and the two fish and says, Father, thank you. Bless this. And then he breaks it. And what does he do? He gives it back to the disciples. And then they're able to do what he told them to do in the first place. They were able to feed the 5,000 because what little they had, they placed in Jesus' hands and he blessed it and handed it back. And that empowered and equipped them to do what he told them to do in the first place. 
Every now and then people are like, God says we're to do this, but I just don't think I can do it. I said, yeah, that makes you normal. So why not place it in God's hands and tell him you want to obey him and thank him for the little that you have and see what he does. Then instead of you being, I am a good godly person, instead you're saying, wow, isn't God amazing and merciful? Amen. How did the disciples receive God's empowerment? By responding to what Jesus called them to do, by giving to Jesus what little they had, and by doing what he told them to do. And it was amazing. We say this at Crosstown all the time. Whatever Jesus commands you to do, he will also empower and equip you to do it. Because if he didn't, that would make him cruel. And God is not cruel. And yet I hear people all the time trying to do something that they think a good person ought to do, and they struggle, and they fail, and they cry, why isn't God helping me do this? I said, because you left him out of the picture. You're on your own. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me and you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah, we can put a lot of effort into it, but it amounts to nothing. In Matthew 14, however, Peter, the enthusiastic extrovert, wants to take it to a whole nother level. Knowing that whatever Jesus commands him to do will also empower and equip him to do it. Let's see what he does in verse, verses 22 through the end of the chapter. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. It's the only way to get away from the crowds. Get in a boat, right? While he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, man, they were rowing all night long against the wind. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Didn't know we had so many ghost stories here today. <laughs> By the way, that's the only time scripture refers to a ghost. The uh, Greek word is basically where we get the word phantom from. The Holy Spirit, King James called it the Holy Ghost, but really, it's pneuma, spirit, which is the same as wind. But uh, a phantom is a ghost. They thought it was a ghost. And the only ghost there, it turns out, it wasn't really a ghost. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You think he was talking to Peter who started sinking? Or the eleven who wouldn't set foot out of the boat. <laughs> and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him, and begged him to let the sick touch just the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. So the disciples, we like to give the disciples grief, right? But let's just face it, 
If you're out on, in a boat in the middle of a lake at night and you see somebody out there hovering above the water, you're going to freak out, right? That is not a normal experience. And again, they think you must be a ghost because people can't walk on water. It's their only concept they have, right? What else could they assume it is? Especially it's dark and it's stormy and it's like, they probably thought at first it was like, a young woman in a bridal dress. They heard all those stories as a kid, you know. <laughs> they think people can't walk on water, but you know who they thought could walk on water? Back in Job chapter 9, verse 8 says, He alone stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. That's right. No wonder they knew he was the Son of God. Because only God can do that. So after they're all done freaking out, and I would have, okay, it's kind of twisted. I would have loved to see them freaking out. Who are they pulling in front of them? <laughs> yeah. After they're all done freaking out, Peter has an idea. Hey, whatever Jesus tells us to do, we can do it. Hey, Lord, tell me to come to you. This is going to be great. <laughs> Sure, the disciples, you're an idiot. <laughs> because Peter knows that whatever Jesus calls him to do, he will also empower and equip him to do it. So what does he do? He asks Jesus to command him to do something extraordinary, knowing that if Jesus calls him to walk on the water, he will be able to walk on the water. He doesn't just jump out saying, watch this, guys. No. He asked Jesus, command me to do it. Peter didn't ask Jesus to let him do something sinful or destructive. There's people that, Lord, just this one time, let me get away with this, you know. No, that's all bad. He didn't ask him to do something destructive. Lord, can you torch the rest of them? Because they're not. No. Peter didn't ask Jesus to command him to do something that he had already commanded to do or that scripture had already commanded him to do. The scripture is full of commands and people are like, but I really don't want to do that. I don't want to tithe. I, I don't want to treat my neighbor with uh, love and respect. Lord, make me want to do it. Yeah. Courage is doing the scary stuff anyway, even though you're afraid. <clears throat> no. Matter of fact, did Jesus say, Lord, empower me to walk on water too? And then they run laps around the boat. No, what did he ask him? Lord, tell me to come to you. Let me get closer to you. Jesus had already given a command, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. They were rowing against the wind all night long. You see, when God created the heavens and the earth, and Colossians says Jesus was right there from the beginning and God was creating through him all of creation. When God said, let there be light, not only did he say that, but his words created the light. So his commands both give the command and also make it happen at the same time. So he said, let there be light. Jesus told Peter, come to me, that the very command empowered him to do what Jesus had called him to do. In the words of God was the power for what was commanded to happen. So what have you noticed in God's word that he has commanded you to do, but you haven't yet done it? Maybe he's commanding you to start doing something and uh, you're an introvert, so you're an analyzer and you're thinking of all the various complications and you're overwhelmed. Sometimes you just got to quit thinking about it and take the first step. I found sometimes there are big projects you don't even know how to start and you got to put aside the big picture and say, what's one step I can take in the right direction? And you take that first step. When God called Abraham out of the land of his ancestors, he said, come to the land that I will show you. 
He didn't even tell Abraham where he was going when Abraham packed up and left. He just said, you're going to be heading west. He had no idea. Any of you get in your car at night, you start it up, you turn on the headlights, you're like, sorry, we can't go to grandma's. The headlights only shine, you know, 50 feet ahead of us. Well, no, you drive 50, far, 50 feet. <laughs> and amazingly, you can see the next 50 feet. Never know what the Lord's going to do. <laughs> so what have you noticed in God's word that he commanded you to do? Some of you think you might not be able to start doing what he's calling you to do. Maybe there's something he wants you to stop doing. And you don't think you can stop. And you know, some of us don't give up what God wants us to give up because we're afraid we'll fail at it and we don't want to lie to God. And we're like, God, I don't have the strength, I don't have the courage, I don't have the know-how, I don't have the ability to stop doing this. So I'm not going to tell you I'm going to stop and then fail because I don't want to lie to you. You know what? He can handle the fallout. And Lord knows, a lot of us, it takes a whole bunch of, try, bunch of tries before we get it right. And He's not going to smack us down for not being perfect. That's what social media is for. People out there criticize you or criticize various systems for not being perfect. God doesn't measure us in perfection. He measures us in progress. I'm not where I want to be, but by the grace of God, I'm not where I was. That's what we celebrate. So when you... Maybe during your times of prayer this week, or your time in reading God's Word, and He says, I, I want my people to do this. You're like, I'm not doing that. And you're like, I don't even know how to do that. We don't know how to feed people with just five loaves. Put it in the hands of Jesus. Give thanks for the little that you have, and see what He does with it. Do you think you can't do it, or are you thinking, yeah, I should try that sometime? It's not your good idea. It's God's idea, so now is probably the time. When He commands you to do something, that's the time to do it. I remember when we were getting ready to start Crosstown, and um, the, Paula and I, we grew up at First Baptist, and they said, we, we want you to consider planting another church in another part of town. I said, yeah, like I need that kind of nightmare. I've seen how it's done. You need to go get them extrovert. I'm the opposite end of the scale, but you know, ministry, you're kind of obligated to pray about it ahead of time before you flat out say no. And the more we prayed, the more we just knew this is what God wants us to do. And my reaction was, what are you thinking? Are you kidding me? It's like, well, good, then I'll get all the credit <laughs> and you'll just be along for the ride. And in praying about it, God just give, kept giving me Jesus' words, quoting Isaiah in Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's given me, He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Recovery of sight to the blind. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to do these things. I mean, I'm fresh out of seminary. This is my first church. I, have, I don't have this experience. And there was another pastor who was kind of mentoring me from up in uh, Sonora and Arnold. And uh, he said, I just think God's going to bless you. I just really think he's going to take you and anoint you to preach good news to the poor. And he goes on to quote that verse. I said, that's the verse that keeps coming to my head. And, and he's like, well, there's God's confirmation right now. You're doing what he calls you to do. And so we came to this neighborhood because we thought that's kind of neglected and then it's like how do you reach people I didn't have any way to connect but I could just keep asking God Lord can you show up here we are here's what little we have and you just keep plugging away and then God started bringing in the broken through no efforts of my own other than on my knees begging God to show up and and it's been an amazing ride ever since just taking the little that we had and putting it in the hands of Jesus instead of whining and complaining how little we have, thanking God for what little we have and placing it in His hands. 
You know, when Jesus told the lame, stand up and walk, he also empowered and equipped them to stand up and walk, right? So what is he calling you to do? Is there something you wish you could do, but you can't? <clears throat> By nature, believe it or not, I'm an introvert, which means I overanalyze everything. And so, you know, if it's like, get up and walk, I'd be like, you mean like without leaning on the chair to help myself, or do I need a stick, or exactly, which foot should I do for, Jesus would have pulled his hair. Yeah. Just step forward and do what he asks. Is there something you wish you could do but can't? And so you may be thinking, is this my own enthusiasm, wishing I could help somebody? Or is this actually God moving on your heart? You know, God can even, if you give him permission, he'll change how you feel. He has absolutely broken my heart for people I had no compassion for. And he has soured my likes on things when I said, Lord, I don't know if this is pleasing to you or not, so I give you permission to sour me on it if you want me to let that go. And after a couple months, I realized I wasn't listening to it anymore. Give him permission to do these things. Invite him in to search you and know you and see if there is any way in you that is displeasing. And you'll find that if he does break your heart for somebody, and, and it's a variety of reasons. You may be able to explain some. Some, maybe you had a family member or, or a friend who died of something, or, or God delivered you out of something, and you're remembering all those who are still enslaved in it. Those are God-given passions. And if you don't know how to reach him, good. Then Jesus will get all the credit when you reach them. Take what little you have and say, Lord, you've, you're stirring my heart. You're making restless to reach these people, but I can't seem to do it. We, we've shared before how Shailen got, get, put it on her heart to go to the, the Congo on a mission trip, and she, she got online and learned basic Swahili to go reach the people of the Congo, and, and she was all ready to go, and then COVID hit. And she's like, God, all this preparation... Why would you have me spend hours learning Swahili and then not let me go to Congo? And the mission agency said, well, we do need somebody for a mission trip to Kansas. And she's like, Kansas? Really? Really? If it were me, I would have said, that's as far as you can get me on. Yeah. <laughs> but I obedience to the Lord, she went to Kansas and they had her work in a refugee camp full of Congolese. God knows what he's doing. He knows why he puts passion in your heart. And when all is said and done, you're overwhelmed. And you're like, who am I that the Lord would take notice of me and use me in such an amazing way? I swear, every week I run into somebody and they're like, how's the church going? And I start telling stories about you all. And they're like, that's great. How do you know to do that? I said, I didn't. <laughs> I just begged God to show up. And, and, and every week I tell somebody, I am found following Jesus is like being a passenger on a motorcycle. You have no control. You hang on really tight so you don't fall off. And it's both thrilling and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> following Jesus, son of David, is like a passenger on a Harley, son of David. <laughs> <laughs> I've read about people who actually drowned because they were confident in their ability to have enough faith to walk on water. And then their friends were like, Lord, why did you let that happen? It's like, I never called them out. You grew up learning if you jump in deep water, you're going to drown. It's not about showing how bold you can be for Jesus. It's about boldly following when he calls. They weren't acting in obedience to Jesus' command. And maybe your heart breaks for a certain group and you don't know where to start. Maybe your prayer need to be like Peter. Jesus, please call me to come serve these people. I don't know where to start. I don't know what I can do. But you're, you're pulling my heart towards them. And so, Lord, I throw it back up to you. Show me, Lord. God put it on the staff one year to start a divorce recovery workshop at First Baptist. And, and the pastors are like, 
our plate's full already. What we needed is God to put this on somebody's heart. And so they spend some time praying for it. One of the associate pastors goes out in the parking lot and sees a lady getting his heart in her car and just comes out of his mouth. Hey, can I talk to you a second? She's like, sure. What, what do you need? I said, we really think God wants to start a divorce recovery workshop here at First Baptist. Would you consider taking the lead on that? And she just started crying. She said, I've been praying for this for months. And you're like, God, you sneaky person. You know? <laughs> You've been working behind the scenes on all this. He can do that with you also. You feel like God wants you to do something you don't know where to start? Lord, command me to come to you. Just show me where you're working in these areas. So let me ask you, is there something you wish you could do, but you can't? Ask Jesus to command you to do it, and then see what he says. See how he tells you to take the steps in that direction. Don't make bold vows about the great things you're going to do for God. God is not impressed with you. He loves you. Anything Jesus calls you to do, he will also empower and equip you to do it. And if you're not sure, ask Jesus command you to do something. There's no harm if he says no. He could have told Peter, knock it off, I'm coming to the boat, right? But he may really shock and surprise you. Just be ready to step out of the boat when he says, come to me. Lord, we thank you that you have called us to come follow you. And Lord, just about all of us had no idea what we were getting into when it all started. And Lord, there continues to be a mystery because we don't know what's around the corner. And yet, Lord, you, um, you love us. And you have great adventures for us. And you didn't just come into our lives just for us but so that we could share you with the lost and hurting world. And Lord, sometimes you look us in the eye and say, come to me, and the gap between us and you is both terrifying and exhilarating at the same time. But Lord, we will step out in faith because it is you that has called us. And Lord, we thank you that um, this has nothing to do with our level of boldness, but everything to do with your power especially the power at your word and at your command. Lord Jesus, we would not have access to our Heavenly Father, but your word says that um, by your torn body, you opened a way that we could be in God's presence each and every day to empower and equip us to do what he calls us to do. And so, Lord, we give you thanks for empowering and equipping us to do what you have called us to do by your body broken for us, by your precious blood poured out for us. So Lord, as we prepare our heart for sharing in the Lord's table today the bread and the juice, Lord, we thank you for you who went into that terrifying place, the cross, so that we would be empowered and equipped to live in God's presence, that our sins would be forgiven so we could stand before you righteous and holy and blameless because we are in Christ. We laid ourselves aside and have clothed ourselves with Christ, as your word says. And so, Lord, as we share in the elements today, Lord, we invite you to bring to our recollection the things that you have commanded us to do or maybe just one thing you have commanded us to do so we can take that first step. And Lord, many of us will say, I don't know how that's going to work, but I can at least take one step in the right direction to obey your command, and then we marvel and wonder at what you do. Lord, thank you for calling us to you today. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Thank you, my Lord. The Gospel says that... Uh, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body given for you. 
And he said, every time you take bread, every time you break bread, not just Communion Sunday, he's talking also about dinner rolls and burger buns and all these different things. He said, every time you take bread, do this in remembrance of me. No great bold acts, just remember he did it all. From the cross, he said, it is finished. He's already done. That same night, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you. In the Old Testament, when the things were dedicated to the Lord, they sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice on it so they could see the blood on it and say, this has been cleansed and made holy by the blood of the Lamb set aside for the purposes of God. His atoning blood on the cross for us made us holy and set us aside for the purposes of God. And all he said is, every time you drink from the cup, do this in remembrance of me. Because when we remember what he's done for us, it drives out all fear. Here at Crosstown, we don't demand that you be a member to share in the Lord's table. We just ask that at some point, you have prayed and invited the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart. If you've ever prayed that prayer, then you are more than welcome. The ladies will bring the trays around. And the first film peels open. There's a little bread wafer on top. And the second one has the, the juice underneath it. We don't ask that um, you make any declaration. We just trust that you will do this in remembrance of him and what he's done for you. Lord, bless these elements as we pass them today. As we remember, your body, your word says, your body was torn like the temple curtain, opening the way between us and God so we were no longer separated from the presence of God. And that your atoning blood paid for our sins on the cross so that your word says we stand before the Father righteous and holy and blameless. Lord, we would never claim that for ourselves. All we can do is say thank you, Lord Jesus, for providing it when we had no other way. And so, Lord, as we take the bread, as we take these cups, we do these in remembrance of you. We do it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.